following special presentation is being brought to you by the Independent Marketing Associates and their advertising cooperative at Denali Health Sciences, Life Wave Energy Products, BizBug, The Better Business Solution, AmericansBulletin.com, FirstAmendmentRadio.com, TruthRadio.info, FamilyRightsRadio.net, LighthouseMinerals.com, FreeAmericaRadio.ws, and the Inside View Worldwide Radio Broadcasting Group. We're the Real Public Radio. Thank you, Cal. Join us today. Please note that the following views and the opinions expressed on this program are not necessarily the views nor the opinions of our sponsors nor of this radio network. Coming to you live from Studio Z at the Lighthouse in North Central Florida and TruthRadio.com in the land of dreams, enchantment, and nightmares, it's We Are All Doing Time, the Victim in Prison Outreach with Desert Owl and Alexis Endurance. If you want to make a difference in your world, ladies and gentlemen, then stay tuned and learn the truth about what's really going on in your world because we're all doing time. And you know it doesn't matter whether you're on the inside or on the outside. We're all doing time. So please tell your friends. And here's a special tribute called Love Remembers by the Massad family. Patrick Sweeney has tried 
every available court in Alabama and at the federal level to get this case heard, but courts don't seem to want to hear about innocent people being thrown in jail. Mr. Sweeney has irrefutable scientific proof from one of the most renowned and trustworthy forensic scientists in the United States that he is innocent, but still he sits in prison because the courts aren't interested in hearing his evidence of innocence. The prosecutors aren't even interested in looking at the evidence that they got the wrong guy. I wonder what kind of legal system we have where we can claim to have an honest, just system and yet allow the guilty to go unpunished while an innocent man sits in prison as punishment for someone else's crime. I wonder, I also wonder how many other victims the guilty party has in the nearly, try that again, I, I also wonder how many other victims the guilty party has in the nearly two decades since this crime occurred. Our, our prosecutors and courts are supposed to be keeping us safe from crime, not simply convicting people. That is un-American. I'm glad that there are people like you, two journalists, who are interested in the truth. We are the foundation upon which, you are the foundation upon which this country was built. Uh, Candace Hawk, Washington State. And uh, thank you, Candace, for that, that email that you sent. And thank you to all of you out there from England to Canada and across America that sent your emails regarding this issue, and it's a great honor uh, and privilege to, uh, uh, well, let me let me introduce uh, Alexis Endurance uh, to Truth Radio listeners first. Uh, Alexis, are you there? I'm here. And Alexis Endurance is my uh, good radio, morning. Good morning. Uh, my radio co-host from Saturday morning, her son got 47 years, he knows the score, we know the score, I got life without mercy and three death threats from a sheriff, so I'd be killed when I got to prison. Alexis, her son is innocent and done 14 years, got 47, and and we know uh, time is short here, and so uh, if you want to hear Alexis' story and, and more from her, um, you, you just got to come by Saturday, every Saturday morning from 8 a.m. to 12 noon, Eastern Time, on uh, FamilyRightsRadio.net, or get on the conference line, and we'll give that out later. But we can do it right now, okay, because we know you're listening in. The conference line, you know, is a place you want to interact, you want to ask questions, 641 297 Seven two zero zero. That's the conference line we tie into with all of our radio programs. Six four one two nine seven seven two zero zero. And the access pin number is five three two three four five in Hip Town. That's five three two three four five in Hip Town. And and I wanted to like you to be here today in case um you know you have any uh, questions you want to ask uh um uh, hey. yes and uh, so thank you for that and uh, so without any further delay because we have got a long way to go and a short time to get there let's bring on. Uh, Sherry Sweeney. Uh, Sherry, welcome to We Are All Doing Time, the Victim and Prison Outreach Program. Welcome, Sherry. Thank you, Desert, and thank you, Alexis. Um, it's an honor to be here. Yeah, it's Good. an honor to have you here. Absolutely. I know your story has really been a hard road, you know, and um, I can see you, and uh, you're doing the right thing, and you just continue doing things, sorry, continuing your fight, uh, and, you know, just do everything, and then I Funny to look at it, but really, they don't care because they, you know, they want to have people in prison. They don't care if they have uh, the innocence in there. It's all about the money, and it's all about the bond that they have in each prisoner. And I hope you're successful, and I know that some way the doors are going to be knocked down. Well, well, this is your first time on, on radio, uh, uh, Sherry, sharing your story. So why don't you uh, take it from the beginning and, and, tell, and play it out the way you want to uh, tell it. Uh, okay, um, Patrick Sweeney is uh, a former police officer, and uh, he was assigned to an undercover drug investigation down in Gulf Shores, Alabama, and uh, that was in the late 70s. And uh, he was responsible for um, exposing uh, drug smuggling and racketeering, and the two uh, people that were uh, convicted of this crime turned out to be a district attorney and the chief investigator for the sheriff's office. So they were convicted and sent to federal prison for their crimes, and then in 1987, he was, uh, Patrick was framed for a double murder. 
And uh, we think that that's all connected. How long, um, how long was that interim, that time interim? It was uh, about, actually it was about 10 years, and we oh. have no proof to connect the two, but we think that it's connected. Yeah, yeah. Um, at any rate, uh, so he was... Hello, uh, Sherry? I'd like to see you there. Yeah, I'm here. I think we lost the first second. You could have just pushed into the button. If you can hear us, Jerry, just call back in again. Yeah. Okay, well, we're talking to... Yeah, this is Jerry Sweeney. Jerry Sweeney, yeah, and um, uh, she's um, been fighting for her husband for 18 years. In the meantime, then we'll open up the back line. Okay, do we have on um, our listeners... Uh, we yes. Have... Hello? Yes. Yes, and what was your name again? Uh, uh, Esther Brown, and I'm the executive director for Project Hope to Abolish the Death Penalty in Alabama. Right. And I can really uh, emphasize um, with Sherry, I, uh, I do know her, and I know what she's going through, and um, what you said about the court not caring about innocence, it's just so true. I mean, you know, there was a, a U.S. Supreme Court justice who said, that innocence can come too late. And that's something that is incomprehensible to me. And how can innocence ever come too late? But it does. Sherry, are you back? No. Not yet. All right, then <laughs> you're going to have to carry it without her. Um, you don't think there's a conspiracy connected with that, do you? Boy. I, I, I wouldn't put anything <laughs> past anything. I'm telling you, well, when it happens, it happens. My computer goes down today. Uh, yes. That is very strange. Yeah. Um, and Esther, what's the name of your, your organization again? For the Project rest? Hope to Abolish the Death Penalty. Okay, Project. It is a, 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 a death row organization founded by, um, founded by death row inmates and run by death row inmates, and I'm the person on the outside. Just what's the website? Project Hope to Abolish the Death Penalty, P-H-A-D-P dot org. Yeah. Now, what do you know, What? how long have you been following... Uh, uh, Shelly now, because we want to stick on her. Oh, I think, yes, we want to stick to her. Um, I have known her for about seven years, and I have been amazed at her at persistence. But you see, that's really what it takes to overturn something. And, of course, we all, we all know, it, or, or perhaps some of us know, that Patrick is not well. He, um, I, I think he's had a couple of heart attacks, and um, he has been... Um, uh, uh, punished uh, whenever he spoke out, and, you know, that's a very e easy thing to do in prison. You um, you lock them up and, uh, th so that they cannot communicate. But um, meanwhile, they, they did have um, some tests done. Um, it was a firearm forensic, and I really am sorry about that because I should not be the one to, um, you know, to speak about that. Um, but... These tests, uh, which were not available at the time of the crime, proved um, that Patrick could not have committed the crime. And that is um, what I believe they've been trying to introduce. And, uh, you know, the appeals were just denied, really, without any explanation. They, they, it was never heard. And they were hopeful that, that, that when they would come to the federal level, um, that they then would be heard. But, of course, at the moment, um, the 11th um, court is not very defendant. Hi, Mr. Oh, sorry. good. I'm sorry. I'm glad you're back. Okay, you just no, go over. No, Alexis yeah. just tried to call her, I think. Record your message at the time. When you were finished recording. Alexis, did you just try to call Sherry? Uh, I'm on. Oh, hi, Sherry. You're back. Good. Welcome Please back. Please take over. Esther's been covering yeah. for you. Thank yeah. you, Esther. That was excellent. Yes. Esther Brown, Project Hope to abolish the death penalty. We'll have you on our program, too, Esther, for sure. Okay. Yeah. Works in a serious way. Yeah. Yeah. Sh in this universe. Yeah, Sherry. Okay, Sherry. Please carry on. You bet. Thank you. And do a better job than I can for you. Uh -huh. We're good. a real public radio. We couldn't do a better job. Uh, we're, we're just, uh, we do it on a wing and a prayer, and, um, and we, we, we care. We give a damn. And, we're, and we've got, we've got, um, we're, we're all road scholars because we know the road is tough, and, and we, uh, we've all been uh, affected by this somehow. And Sherry, please continue your story now. Sherry, he's not gone again. Alexis, are you there? I'm here. What in the world is going on with Sherry's phone? But that, 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 this does not make any sense. No, I, I, I was calling her. I was bewildered. Yeah, well, she.
her, she knows how to call in, so we'll leave her. Jack is at the number. Yeah, and um, you know, and I um, would offer you to call in on my uh, my Skype phone, but my computer's down, ladies and gentlemen. Um, you know, it's true that the people don't want want the word out. It's, it's true what happened with uh, Patrick uh, Sweeney, and again, go to the website patrickcrusade.org. It's a beautiful website, also. Oh, um, yeah, I was overwhelmed when I saw the work involved with it, Patrick. Crusade. It is a crusade, and there's so much information on there. Uh, it can take you a thousand different directions, depending upon what uh, your specific interest is, what you're trying to learn. PatrickCrusade.org. And you know, there, it, it is true that that people do not want us to um, to talk about what's really going on, because if we knew the truth about what's really going on, we would uh, be very upset and, and overwhelmed. Your jaw would hit the floor, ladies and gentlemen. Now, uh, and uh, sorry, is that you? I'm I'm back. I, I don't know what happened. You <laughs> don't know. You just dropped off the world, huh? I guess so. <laughs> okay. Well, somebody doesn't want you on here. And you know, the final point I was going to make is what happened with uh, 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 Patrick Sweeney, a good cop that uh, wanted to make a difference and didn't. He, he didn't. He wasn't one of those uh, players that um, are, are, are uh, there working both sides of the fence. And and the, 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 what I've learned in my political activism and. Uh, almost 15 years now, throughout the 90s, is that what we really have going on here, I'm speaking for myself, and, and I know uh, the direction that Jerry, uh, Sherry wants to go in with the story, but I've got, to, I've got to say for the record that the, basically what the Patrick stumbled in on, I know, is that he, he saw the corruption within his own world, within his own rank, and he couldn't stand by, and he did something about it. And the problem is, is that the, these, these uh, ranks, of, of, uh, of criminal elements that are within uh, police forces, within our uh, 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 judicial system, is throughout America. It, 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 and we could go worldwide that, that there's a system of corruption, and, and it's, a, it's a dark element. And they, they work with secret handshakes and, 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 uh, and code words and signs, and, and they, they basically run the show today, ladies and gentlemen. That's, uh, that's a story for another day. But that's why they could come back on him and do what they did because when he got two of them, he didn't get them all. He just got two small elements in a big pool that um, that uh, work all to support each other and you can and, and to, to fight against this corruption and darkness uh, without you know without the aid of Christ is, is almost impossible. They will come and get you. They will pay you back. They are they are in essence the, the, the legalized form of the mafia and then they, they they say they're here to serve and protect us. What they're doing is they're, they're working to serve and protect themselves, and we are all their, uh, their father whenever it's convenient. And now, uh, sorry for taking so much time there, Sherry. Please uh, get back to your story. Sorry? I don't believe it. Yeah. Um, I, I, I think another important issue, and, and, and again, I'm not really qualified to speak about that, uh, is the issue of prosecutorial uh, misconduct. Yeah, and I think Sherry just beamed in, right, Sherry? You bet. Oh. Yeah. Okay, try to really do that. You, you were at the point, I think you were talking about, um, that he, he was a, a fellow uh, police officer at Integrity, and he was disgusted with the court with the corruption that, um, that it was going on in the department, and eventually he turned in his badge. So, are you there? No. No. Okay, go but, ahead. Uh, you, um, one of the other issues, one of the other issues is the prosecutorial um, misconduct, and, and again, you know, you're talking about the widespread corruption and so on. I would like to say that I feel it's particularly bad in the South. Maybe you don't yeah. agree with that. No, I do, I do. But it's, <laughs> okay. it's bad in West Virginia. It's, it's bad in Pennsylvania. Yeah. It, it's throughout, and it Washington is, is, the, is the worst haven of them all. Uh, uh, Sherry, I think you're back, right? I think I'm back, and I used the, the, the first um, um, five, three, two, three, four, five to get in this time and see if that works better. Okay. Are you, are you on a cell phone? No. No, you're landline. No. Okay. Well, I'm on a regular phone. Well, um, it, one of the interesting things you were saying earlier about the mafia and the so-called uh, you know protectors of our nation yeah. is that um, when they're involved in something, it's uh, it's about impossible to prove the connection. And uh, but we we really think that there is a connection there. But it, it, that set aside, we've already scientifically proved that Patrick is innocent, and we've all we've also proved that there was evidence tampering. Uh, <clears throat> 
in the, in the trial or before the trial. And, uh, and then we've also proved that there's uh, withheld exculpatory evidence, uh, you know, from the trial. Um, for example, in 2002, I started to say before I got cut off uh, that the district attorney, the present district attorney, who was the assistant district attorney during the trial, uh, gave us a photograph, a crime scene photograph, that showed uh, something entirely different than what they showed in the trial. We never knew anything about this until uh, 2002, and then in 2003, um, we um, we received uh, scientific forensic evidence that absolutely proved his innocence, as Esther had talked about. It was um, gunshot residue uh, evidence that showed that he could not have fired the weapon the way that they said. He could not have fired any weapon uh, at the time of the crime. Now, being a police officer, uh, he's a, he, he was trained to be a very good shot. All police officers were supposed to be very good at that. And the, the district attorney that was at the trial made it sound like because he was a, a crack shot, that meant that he was guilty. I mean, they, they do what I call Alabama speak, and Esther probably knows what this is. <laughs> yeah, they, they things around to where you don't even know what's going on. Yeah, it's sort of like uh, out, uh, outcome-based education. What kind of an outcome are you talking about? You know, it does not to make sense. That, that's a statement that doesn't make sense. It doesn't have to make yeah. sense. Yeah. What they said happened in the trial, here's the scenario by the state. The state said that Patrick stalked these people, and uh, I saw it was his, his wife. They had been married for five months, only five months, and the wife turns out that she was actually having an affair with the district attorney and several other people. And uh, so the story is that um, Patrick uh, came to the property. They had had an argument the night before, which is true. Uh, his wife was an alcoholic, and every time they had an argument, he, his M.O. was he left and went to his mother's house, and then she would go to his mother's house later on and go get him, fetch him, and they would make up, and that was just their life. It was a weird life, but that's what they did. And um, so the night that they had an argument, he went to his mother's house, and then the next day, he remembered that they, the dogs that they had had not been fed, so he went to the house, feed the dogs, and uh, he saw his wife and somebody else, another man, through the window, you know, having, you know, sexual uh, feelings going on. And so the state scenario is that he saw that and immediately went to his truck and got his rifle and shot through the window, and uh, that shot went into the mail. Uh, victim's neck and dropped him cold, and then he ran around his to his front door and broke the door down. Yeah, you know this is where he lived. Now this is supposed to be Patrick attacking, now, right? <laughs> this is what the state said that Patrick did. Yeah. Okay. And then he ran around to the house and uh, broke open the door and then proceeded to uh, shoot his wife six times and from the front and the back, and then he went over to the the man and shot him uh, execution style in the head. Well, we've shown that he had no blood on him. He had no blood on his shoes. He had no yeah. blood on his clothes. He had no blood anywhere on him. Okay. And our forensic scientists and several others have said, you can't be in a crime scene like that and shoot somebody like that and not have blood, at least some blood splatter on you. Uh, not to mention these you things. can't shoot this particular weapon that the state said he used right. and not be absolutely covered with gunshot residue. That's right. And now we've, we've proven this beyond any kind of reasonable doubt. Well, well, I already see what's going on here. Apparently, um, you know, if we ever wanted to see the clear picture, it's obvious that the who would have the motive to do this, uh, the, the man who owns the house, his wife is inside having an affair with another man, he's the one who would have motive, and it just happens that uh, they found the right taxi. Yeah, now it's typical that when there's a, a shooting of this sort that the husband is the first suspect. But after investigating and finding out that he had no gunshot residue on him and he had no blood on him and he has no memory of what went on because he was knocked out unconscious, then that's the point when the police should be saying, oh, okay, we have to exclude this suspect and go on and look for the next. They didn't do that with Patrick's case. They just they didn't look for anybody else. And there, was, 
through the women that they could have for us because it seemed like she was promiscuous. She was very promiscuous, and uh, the, the man that she was with turned out to be her ex-husband. And uh, so, so we think that um, whoever did the shooting probably thought that, that they were seeing Patrick and his wife together and that they meant to get him and got her too, you know, just to cover their truck. That's what we think yeah. happened. Because he, well, Patrick did have his wife threatened also several times. Did, and we have a picture of one of the uh, threats, and uh, during, this was during the drug uh, investigation where he was attacked by three uh, men, and his face was cut up very badly, and they left him there to bleed to death. And uh, he managed to carry himself to the hospital, and I think it took, well, it took hundreds and hundreds of stitches. And today you can't see the scars on his faces unless you know where to look. But, uh, yeah, he had, had a translation attempt, two of them, during this event. Okay. Hope you thought, uh, Sherry, we're going through a break. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, you're listening to We Are All Doing Time, the Victim and Prison Outreach Program with yours truly, Desert Owl, Alexis Endurance, and all of you. And uh, we sure um, want you to... Uh, Tell the story to others, but don't forget to replay tonight at 11 p.m. Eastern Time, truthradio.com. And look for us tomorrow on familyrightsradio.net. Familyrightsradio.net. Thanks to Thomas Rogers and... This is Bishop Truman Burst, Master Herbalist for 43 years. We've offered free natural health counseling. And we are a Christian evangelical church and uh, in Albany, Oregon. And we share the gospel of the good news and, and how to be healed in every part of your life, spiritually and physically. Paul Truman at 1-800-345-4152, extension 0. Listen and call in to Discoveries in Health Monday through Friday, 11 to 12 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, USA, on truthradio.com. How many times have friends of yours who discuss the issues of the day with you, looked at you sort of uh, over the tops of their glasses with um, a superior gaze and said, uh, you are a conspiracy nut. A conspiracy nut. That's what you are. And <laughs> it's frustrating, isn't it? You know, people who see clearly what's going on in the world can't escape the fact that things happen because they happen to be planned. <laughs> and uh, a lot of leaders in our world have seen clearly that uh, conspiracies seem to rule even the major governments of the world. And one of those people was President John F. Kennedy. On April 27, 1961, President Kennedy spoke to a group of major publishers and members of the media at a press gathering in Washington, D.C. Here's what he had to say about the subject of conspiracies. But I do ask every publisher, every editor, and every newsman in the nation to re-examine his own standards and to recognize the nature of our country's peril. In time of war, the government and the press have customarily joined in an effort based largely on self-discipline to prevent unauthorized disclosures to the enemy. In times of clear and present danger, the courts have held that even the privileged rights of the First Amendment must yield to the public's need for national security. Today, no war has been declared, and however fierce the struggle may be, it may never be declared in the traditional fashion. Our way of life is under attack. Those who make themselves our enemy are advancing around the globe. 
the survival of our friends is in danger. And yet no war has been declared. No borders have been crossed by marching troops. No missiles have been fired. You're listening to the Victim and Prison Outreach Program. We are all doing time. And you know, it doesn't matter whether you're on the inside or on the outside. We're all doing time, ladies and gentlemen. And that's why you need to get the book that inspired the radio program, We Are All Doing Time. It's called We're All Doing Time by Bo Lukoff from the Human Kindness Foundation. Bo wanted to be a prison guard. He ended up being a, uh, a prison activist. He sent over 700 prisons around the world. So get the book. It's the primer. When you get stuck in a jail somewhere and you're looking at prison hard times, uh, then you're going to see this book on the floor. And it's free to anybody who's incarcerated. You have to pay for it. But when you do, you get, a, you get um, to support the uh, ministry. And the uh, scripture says to visit those who are in prison, and this is the way you can do it. You read the book, and you find out what it's like in prison. It's, it's a big book, and um, and it's, it's a helpful guide. Uh, it tells you how to do, do the hard time. Uh, it's got inspiration. It's got letters from prison. And it's the primer for you, because you never know when you're going to be there. Because you don't have to have, you don't have to commit a crime, ladies and gentlemen, to, to do time. You just have to be at the wrong place at the wrong time. So uh, get to the website humankindness.org, that's humankindness.org, and get the book. And for alternative media coverage, get the American Free Press newspaper. Go to americanfreepress.net or call 202-544-5977. That's 202-544-5977. That's americanfreepress.net. And if you want to uh, help, again, support this radio ministry that we have here, then, then you can do that. Go to jointhesolution.com forward slash we are all doing time and you'll you'll see the solution to solar that is solar energy free installation free product and uh, uh, you heard me right you have to check it out okay go to join the solution.com forward slash we are all doing time and if you don't own a home but you'd like to tell others and and uh, cash in on the explosion that's about to occur with the solar energy market they're going to lock in on 25 percent of the, the uh, homes in America, ladies and gentlemen, over the next 10, 15 years are coming out the gate. It's a history in the making. You can you can join for free as a, a networker, share it with your friends and loved ones, and, and reap a percentage, okay, of that solar energy. So go to citizenray.net. That's C-I-T-I-Z-E-N-R-E. Citizenray, citizenray.net forward slash we are all doing time. One more time, three W's dot citizenray, that's R-E, citizenread.net forward slash free America. Okay, and, um, you know, uh, you've heard about Eddie King, right? Well, he's uh, he's hanging in there, and um, his uh, wife, uh, Cookie, sent me an email I got this morning, and it, uh, it says, I'm working full-time for Eddie. With all the restrictions placed on him, he is unable to research, make calls, and properly prepare for trial. He has to write out motions in triplicate as they will not even let him go to a law library to make copies. He has to depend on the staff to mail his motions, which mysteriously never seems to arrive at their destination. So my job is now to do the research and to look things up for him, help by filing motions, call people for him as he is limited with the phone time and calling lots of people, collect just as it's just not possible. Helping him however I can is my priority and I find it requires all the time I have. Eddie and I cannot expect someone else to do the daily assignments that Eddie gives me. I have little to zero time for myself, let alone trying to think of what I will do to make money. This is a perfect time for me to rely on God for help, to know he, that he will provide for my every need. This is not an easy time for me. I have to be forced into practicing this. And uh, so that's uh, Cookie Kane a great wife of a, of a great husband, a great man, uh, American rights litigators related to the Wesley Snipes story, go to freeeddiekane.com. That's free Eddie Kane, E-D-D-I-E, Eddie Kane, K-A-H-N.com. You remember that he kidnapped him from Panama. I worked for Eddie in his last year, and it was a real happening. He saved over almost 6,000 people from the ravaging and pillaging of the IRS. So please uh, support a, a great cause, just like here with um, Patrick. Sweeney, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, he's got a great wife, obviously, and by her husband. Uh, most women would fold under circumstances like this after 18 years, and, and Sherry's standing strong 
uh, and as a, as a model wife, a model woman, uh, Sherry uh, Sweeney, go to uh, patrickcrusade.org, patrickcrusade.org, and learn the story. Uh, share the website with your friends. Put a link on your website if you can, you know, because a win uh, for uh, Patrick uh, Sweeney is a win for everybody. When when he's a good man, when he was a good cop, thought he could make a difference. He didn't know he didn't know how wicked they were on the dark side. He, he just thought it was an isolated thing, but it's not. That's why they can get away with what they do to Eddie King, with Patrick uh, Sweeney. Uh, uh, Sherry, back to you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, I'm, I can't remember where I left off. <laughs> yeah, well. Uh, one of the things that uh, that I mentioned is the uh, the photograph that we received from the current district attorney. Uh, and uh, I mentioned that also that the state had said that Patrick shot through the window and uh, that bullet um, hit the male victim right in the neck and paralyzed him instantly. Well, when we got the photograph uh, of the crime scene, uh, there is no bullet hole in the window at all. So that uh, that makes that whole uh, state scenario, what the state said, that makes that a, a big lie. And so the state fabricated a hole in the window but they showed that the trial was not a, they showed a piece of glass with a hole in it, but it, the, the glass was not um, in situ. In other words, it wasn't in place in the house. That the, the crime scene photograph that we received from the current district attorney is of the entire house, and it shows the glass in there with no bullet hole. So we presented that to the court along with the evidence that Dr. Nordby, the forensic scientist, um, who was actually... Uh, one of the most, um, uh, uh, he's very well known in, in the field of forensic science, and uh, he's had integrity coming out of his ears. Uh, he, Dr. Norby does most of his work for the FBI, and we are only the third uh, private client that he's ever taken. He was so taken with Patrick's case that he decided to go ahead and, and do the work for us. Um, so um, we have this. We have evidence of tampering with the evidence, and we showed that to the court. We showed the, the gunshot residue evidence to the court. We showed also that the state had withheld uh, vital exculpatory information evidence that showed that Patrick was innocent. They withheld that during the trial, so the jury never saw that stuff. The jury never saw the forensic a report that came from the state that said there was no gunshot residue on Patrick or no blood on Patrick. We showed that to the court. Uh, the state courts denied us all the way. We showed that to the federal court. We had to go to the 11th Circuit Court in Georgia in order for them to give permission for the federal court to hear the case. And the, the circuit court actually came back and said, we did not show a prima facie case that Patrick was innocent, and so we denied us access to the federal court. So now the federal court is saying, well, we don't have jurisdiction to hear this case, so case closed, and that's where we are today. So uh, the, the courts have been wrong in their adjudication of this case, but they have been wrong because the trial was fundamentally unfair. And uh, that fundamental unfairness... Um, is where the, the prosecutor does anything he can do to get a conviction of an innocent person, you know, and, and, and that's how we end up with so many innocent people in prison. So um, now we don't know how we're going to get back into court. <laughs> so what we're doing uh, now is I have a team of 10 uh, very dedicated individuals who are helping me put together a documentary video on Patrick's case. And uh, so we're hoping that we can get that out and uh, distributed to the media, to, uh, you know, all around the world. And, and maybe maybe the right person will see that, and maybe that will help us, uh, you know, get Patrick's case heard. The, um, the party whose wife was shot, he's still around and doing stuff, right? Um, we don't know who that is. We don't know if it's one or two people. There's evidence to show um, well, that maybe there was more than one person doing this. Well, the, the, no, the um, the homeowner, in other words, the man's wife was shot. These were the ones that were fighting all the time, and he said to his mother. It was Patrick's wife. It was Patrick's wife. Patrick, uh, your, your husband's ex-wife? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, I misunderstood that. Okay. 
Yeah, it was Patrick's wife. They had only been married five months. And um, and so uh, they said that Patrick is the one that shot his wife and her ex-husband uh, out of a fit of rage. And, um, the, uh, when you look at the players involved and during his trial, um, he had a trial, and who's the attorney who eventually uh, was the one who, who uh, represented Patrick? Yeah, that was a man named Richard Bell, and he's a divorce lawyer. He, he had only done, uh, I think, a couple of death penalty cases. Okay. And he didn't do them well, because I know one of his clients. Was it Bell? Yeah. Is it Bell? Yeah, just Bell, and, and he's never won a case. Uh, in fact, he's not doing death penalty cases and anymore. I, and I don't know. I don't think divorce attorneys have ever won any criminal cases, because that's the, the criminal attorneys are for, because yeah. they're, they're schools in a lot of areas, and so the one that Mikey Johnson, the attorney of law, he was a criminal attorney, and he was the one who, who declined to, to be the defense attorney. Right? Okay. When you saw the players, if they're all connected, they're all relatives. Yeah, well, the, uh, yeah. What, what yeah Mr. Johnson was the first cousin to the uh, prosecutor, who was uh, J. Michael Campbell. And J. Michael Campbell and uh, the wife that were shot were high school sweethearts. And um, and Mickey Johnson is the second uh, cousin to Patrick. I think that's how it goes. So they have to uh, set up two. Yeah, yeah. They don't want a criminal attorney in there. They probably told them, get out or else. And if they bring in a dump truck lawyer, right, who so knows going to fail the case, they're, gonna, they're, gonna, they're all going to run circles all over him. You know, the, at least the prosecutor will. And then for him not even to motion... Yeah, was that evidence turned over to him uh, with the pictures uh, of the ones that the jurors didn't see? Did he have well, that possession? The attorney had that had that photograph because the the current district attorney. Yeah, currently six. But in 1989, when they held the trial, that photograph was never admitted to the trial. We didn't know it existed. So they withheld evidence. They just did. They withheld evidence. Yeah, they withheld more than just that photograph. Oh, I'm sure they did. And the the prosecutor's uh, investigator actually went to the state medical examiner and told the state medical examiner that during the autopsy he did not need to perform. Uh, he needed to actually deviate from the standard, uh, and he was. Mm -hmm. Told uh, not to perform vaginal swab and fingernail cultures. Now, any time it's standard procedure, any time there's an unnatural death of a female, that those tests are performed. They may not be used; they may be set aside, but they're always performed. So we, you know, uh, the wife, am I still on? The wife was having an affair with the prosecutor. And the prosecutor's investigator told the state medical examiner not to perform the vaginal swab during the autopsy. And, you know, I mean, he couldn't have that happen because that would connect him with the crime. And he had to make sure he should have recused himself because of the closeness of the family that he had, uh, you know, the, the close relationship he had with the family. But he didn't do that. He couldn't do that. He had to make sure that he was the one prosecuting the case to make sure that Patrick was convicted. Well, we have um, so that DNA was actually destroyed yeah. by not uh, by having the, the state medical examiner not do those tests. And the medical examiner actually testified in the trial that he deviated from standard protocol, and nobody said a word about that. Not the not the lawyer. Not the judge, not the district attorney. That just flew over everybody's head. But there's too much reason that the, the district, the, D, the defense attorney didn't fit into it the way he should have and brought something, you know, he made a statement so he should have brought it out more, exactly, exactly what that entailed. Yeah, he tried to, and then uh, he, he started questioning that during the trial, and the district attorney jumped up and, and uh, objected to that and then changed subject and the lawyer went right along with the same subject so there's like just a few lines in the transcript about that and that lawyer didn't start to get with it in the trial until almost the end of the trial. At the, toward the end of the trial he moved for acquittal 
He uh, talked about um, exculpatory evidence being withheld. He talked about evidence tampering and, uh, he, uh, and all of that, and the judge denied his motion for acquittal. But that's why so he, 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 he was not objecting when he should have objected, and he didn't really catch on to what was going on until toward the end of the trial, and it was a little bit too late by then. Yeah. Well, that's the way they, they, they operate. But you see, Alabama doesn't have a public defender's office. They're one of the very few states where so somebody just gets appointed by the court uh, for very little money, which is most probably what happened, and they aren't necessarily competent. Well, this is not an appointed lawyer. Patrick's mother actually hired this lawyer, and he she hired him because uh, after Patrick left the police department, Patrick went to work for him as a, um, a legal investigator. So Patrick's mother thought, in in good conscience, that uh, Dick Bell would be, uh, you know, would do a good job for Patrick because they knew each other. And uh, but Dick Bell was. Dick Bell was sure that Patrick was guilty, and he went in that way because he believed what the district attorney was telling him. Well, that's no way now, to go our legal system is um, is built on what's called the adversarial principle. In other words, if you have two attorneys taking an opposing viewpoint and arguing it uh, back and forth, in theory, uh, the truth will prevail. But when... Uh, you have everything lopsided, you know, yeah. to where the, the prosecutor can go ahead and tamper with evidence and withhold evidence that shows that the party is innocent. And then the defense team doesn't even doesn't even look into anything. You don't have an adversarial principle. Right. So any, everything was just all lopsided. The adversarial principle was circumvented in Patrick's case. There's no question about that. And we have brought that up to the court. And, of course, the state comes back and says, no, that didn't happen. And the judge says, okay, fine, that didn't happen, case denied. That's the way the Patrick case has been going all along. So there's, there's uh, you know, when when the police or the, or the prosecutor said <laughs> uh, against the accused, you know, and, and nobody looked into it, Hello? Yeah. You okay. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, you're not there? Am I here? Are you there? Yes, you are. You kind of disappeared for a little bit. Okay, am I still on? Yeah, we uh, have a few people uh, standing by on the conference line. Uh, does anyone uh, have a, a comment or a question for uh, Sherry Sweeney? No, oh, okay. I just want to make sure I know we have some listeners there. And... Uh, yeah, I don't like the guy's name either. You know, it's interesting. The guy who orchestrated the uh, conspiracy for, for me up in West Virginia, is the head of it was uh, Charles Bell, the uh, senior trustee in Bethany College, who was friend of Robert Byrd, Senator Robert Byrd, head of MK Ultra Mind Control. And he, he was controlling the very uh, player that they were using that uh, 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 in, in my situation that was committing violence and also had to be killed. And... And so Charles Bell, you know, Bell is uh, the, the metaphor for Lucifer. It's interesting. Um, you got Dick Bell, that boy, if that wasn't a um, code word for, you know, their, um, their cult. And not only that, but the juries, very often, um, the, the foreman of the jury is one of their hand picked. You know, he secretly brought in the trial, and he's the one who, who steers the direction of all the other jurors. There's so much that goes on. Lysander Spooner said since the ratification of the Constitution, there's never been a real trial by jury. You know, so there's so many things wrong with the system. If one thing fails, they got another backup system. And and and, and the first rule is you really got to know the score if you're going to win a battle. You got to know, you know how the players operate. And um, and so there's so much against you when you're going into the court situation. They've got it. They got a hands down. I go into a courtroom. I see the judge giving sign languages. You know, uh, they don't hide from me anymore. And um, you know, when they were doing the uh, the jury for Dyer. Um, as, and Patrick and his lawyer were there, uh, there was one man that Patrick, that was giving Patrick the evil eye, and he and Patrick turned around to his lawyer and he said, I definitely don't want that guy on, on the jury. Right. Because the guy was already giving Patrick an evil eye, which would have been very biased, and that is the guy that turned out to be the foreman of the jury. Oh, geez. Oh, my God. Yeah, and then my, my, my first trial, because I had two of them, um, and the first one, someone says, 
what do, what do we need to deliberate for? You know? In other words, we know, you know, so that's how someone goes into the uh, jury room, right? Uh, it seems to happen to my friends, the same thing. Yeah. They pick the, the worst person that is law enforcement. Yeah. And, least, and I tell my husband, he's going to come out to be the, the foreman, the jury to pick them as the foreman. Yeah, I've, I, I think we're coming down to the end here as Richard has set up a new time frame for us. I think we go off at, at five minutes uh, before the hour, so we got two minutes. And I just want to, uh, final one minute thought, uh, Sherry, please, because we're going to be back uh, with you tomorrow on FamilyRightsRadio.net at 8 a.m. Eastern Time. You'll be on uh, later in the later hours, but um, please give us your final thoughts here. Cap it off, please. Oh, stop it off. We need all the support and all the love and all the help that we can get to bring Patrick home. We're believing strongly that he's coming home this year. It doesn't matter how, how difficult that may seem in uh, human terms, but we do believe that, uh, you know, Patrick's coming home nonetheless. So, uh, the spiritual force that, that we believe in, we, we really hope that everybody will believe with us because that will make it all the stronger. We appreciate Don here, and thank you very much. We have all of us, all the listeners, and um, thank you so much, uh, Sherry, for coming on. Right, and thank you, uh, Alexis, for being with us as well, and, and Sherry Sweeney. Go to the website, patrickcrusade.org, patrickcrusade.org, and also we want to thank Esther Brown, Project Hope, to abolish the death penalty, and uh, Esther, you're welcome to come on tomorrow with us. Uh, 8 a.m. to 12 noon Eastern Time. Uh, the final hour, we have a round table uh, where everybody can join in and talk. Uh, we are all doing time, the Victim and Prison Outreach Program. And, you know, it doesn't matter whether you're on the inside or on the outside, ladies and gentlemen. We're all doing time. And for some of us, it's hard time. And so we want you to spend some time with us and, and hear our pain, our grief, and our hopes for a better life for, for you and I, okay? I'm your host, Desert Owl, saying, uh, don't worry. The law is on your side. You just need to know how to implement it. And that's what we're trying to do. Everybody even stay on the conference line. We'll pick it up uh, after the program. Don't forget, love remembers. Love never forgets.